Hello and welcome to the Explain series with your host, Dr. Brett Palmer. And in this episode, we'll be looking into Mycoplasma genitalium, otherwise known as MGEN. Now, MGEN was first isolated in 1981, so it's quite late in arriving in the world of sexually transmitted infections, and is the smallest known self-replicating uh, bacterium. Uh, it has long-term uh, consequences such as infertility, chronic pelvic pain, ectopic pregnancies, and it does have adverse obstetric outcomes such as preterm deliveries. And it also can cause uh, proctitis. So it is well, very well worth um, suspecting it, investigating it, diagnosing it, and also treating it. This is what uh, Mycoplasma genitalium looks like. And as you can see, it has a tip-like structure. And this tip-like structure allows it uh, to adhere and then invade epithelial cells. An infection can uh, persist for many, many months, as well as many, many years. So the majority of people uh, with uh, MGEN uh, don't develop any disease at all, but MGEN is strongly associated with non-gonococcal urethritis, and the prevalence of MGEN with men with non-gonococcal urethritis is actually about 10 to 20 percent. And in male patients with non-chlamydia non-gonococcal urethritis, that means um, an inflammation of the lining of the inside of the penis, where you pee from, uh, where gonorrhea and gonococcal was both negative, is actually 10 to 35 percent. In men who have sex with men, otherwise known as MSN, uh, one in seven uh, who have treated for gonorrhea and chlamydia uh, have uh, undiagnosed MGM as well. And so it's also important to realise that um, the more partners you have, the higher your chances of mycoplasma genitalium uh, being present uh, in the rectum as well. Uh, pharyngeal, uh, that is, in the throat, uh, MGM is relatively uh, uncommon. Uh, several studies uh, do show an, uh, an association of MGEN infection in women with post-coital bleeding, that's bleeding uh, after sex, uh, uh, with uh, cervicitis and endometriosis as well. Sorry, endometriosis as well, which is inflammation of the lining of the womb, uh, as well as pelvic inflammatory disease, or PID. <coughs> Uh, in terms of the general uh, signs and symptoms of MGEN, uh, well, none. The majority of people are completely asymptomatic. Um, and uh, for men as well, uh, you do get a lethal discharge, a dysuria, a penile irritation, a ureal discomfort, uh, urethral discomfort and uh, urethritis, uh, which can be uh, acute, persistent and can return or recurrent, it can come and go. And you can also have uh, bernopathesis, um, and that was shown in one study, and that is inflammation of the foreskin as well as the glands or the head of the penis as well. Um, the complications that uh, males experience is sexually acquired uh, reactive arthritis and epididymitis, which is inflammation of the tube between the testicle that goes up to the prostate, and it usually carries sperm from the testicle um, uh, up through the prostate and then out down the penis. Yeah, in females, uh, the general signs and symptoms are uh, similar. Again, the majority are asymptomatic, but it can cause a dysuria, postcoital bleeding, uh, painful intermenstrual bleeding, cervicitis, and of course, lower abdo pain, um, for example, uh, pelvic inflammatory disease. And the complications in females, as I said, are pelvic inflammatory disease, tubal factor infertility, um, and sexually re uh, required reactive arthritis, as in the men as well. And it can also, in pregnant women, cause preterm delivery. So how do you diagnose MGEM? Well, you need a full sexual history and a full examination in terms of pelvic and genital. Uh, MGEM is very difficult to grow in the lab, so don't bother. And what we do is we diagnose it by a NATS test. That's a nucleic acid amplification test. And that targets, targets the bacterial uh, DNA or RNA target, depending on the type of test you're having. Uh, so uh, when to test, uh, well you can base it on symptoms and that is individuals with non-gonococcal urethritis, signs and symptoms suggestive of pelvic inflammatory disease, signs and symptoms of uh, mucopleurant cervicitis, in other words a lot of pus coming out of the cervix um, and, and also particularly in post-coital bleeding. Um, we also need to consider in individuals presenting with epididymitis and sexually acquired proctitis. Uh, we could also based on risk factors, and that is, uh, you should test for MGM if any sexual partner has uh, been infected uh, with uh, MGM as well. Uh, uh, what to test? Well, in men, it's a first void urine sample, which is the first bit of urine that comes out. 
um, in women, uh, it is vaginal swabs and these can be either taken during examination or uh, the woman itself can actually uh, take her own swab in the comfort of her own home and send it in or in the lavatory uh, at the lab uh, or in the clinic. Um, uh, what's very important though, so I know this is, um, uh, this is going out to many countries around the world, um, if you do test uh, for uh, MGen, uh, all positive specimens should really be tested for macrolide resistance um, uh, because of uh, mutation to that particular antibiotic. So uh, a lot of uh, people still treat around the world uh, chlamydia with azithromycin and the problem this has is it builds up resistance to mycoplasma genitalium and a lot of mycoplasma genitalium, in fact the vast vast majority of mycoplasma genitalium is now resistant to azithromycin and it's also bearing that in mind. But I'm also uh, very aware that a lot of places around the world do not have uh, resistance testing uh, for uh, MGEM. So if it's available though, it should ideally be done. So what is the management? Well, in general, patients uh, should be advised to abstain from sexual intercourse for uh, until 14 days after the start of the treatment and until symptoms have resolved. They also need a test of cure, I'll come on to that, and all partners should be uh, treated, and this reduces the problem with um, uh, azithromycin. Now, uh, this is a big warning here because the treatment I'm going to say, um, you must uh, look up the most up-to-date treatments because give it a few um, months uh, this treatment guidelines which I'm about to say will probably be out of date and um, because MGM is a fast changing organism okay so please refer to your local national latest guidelines so uncomplicated urogenital um, Infection in terms of urethritis or cervicitis, you treat with doxycycline 100 milligrams twice a day for seven days, followed by azithromycin one gram orally, so that would be on day eight, uh, followed by 500 milligrams orally uh, on day nine and on day 10. Okay, and that's if you know if the status of the MGM is unknown or it is macrolide uh, sensitive. Now, if it is macrolide resistant or they think their partners has a, a macrolide resistant type strain of MGM, and that all macrolide resistant mean is it's resistant to azithromycin, for example, then you give uh, moxifloxacin 400 milligrams oral once a day for 10 days. Okay. Um, and then uh, that can also be the treatment for complicated urogenital infection, for example, PID or epidermal orchitis. Again, moxifloxacin 400 milligrams uh, once a, a day for 14 days. So in pregnancy, it's slightly different. You do a three day course of azithromycin can be used for un uncomplicated MGM infection. Um, and this is because moxifloxacin and doxycycline are contraindicated. Now I know doxycycline is not contraindicated all over the world, but in the United Kingdom, it is contraindicated in pregnancy, okay? Uh, and for breastfeeding, azithromycin can be used if you're breastfeeding, but doxycycline can't because it can um, affect uh, the infant. So uh, there is alternative regimes, but to be honest with you, no one knows how effective it is. I did have one patient um, who ended up going through the very first medication and we ended up curing that patient simply by using doxycycline 100 milligrams BD uh, for 14 days, which is the one to third option on the list. Uh, there's no evidence for that, but sometimes it does work. Um, but there's, as you can see on this list, doxycycline 100 milligrams BD for seven days, then uh, pristomycin one gram orally, four times a day for 10 days, or pristomycin one gram orally four times a day for 10 days. The one I'd prefer, doxycycline 100 milligrams orally twice a day for 14 days, or minocycline 100 milligrams orally twice a day for 14 days. And I don't have any personal experience with minocycline um, or, uh, or pristina um, uh, myosin uh, either. Uh, but the evidence, as I said, for these alternative treatments in the BASH guideline is uh, very, very weak. So test of clearance. So patients should um, uh, perform uh, a test of cure, a test of clearance or a test of cure five weeks and no sooner than three weeks in order to avoid false negative results after the start of their treatment. And this is to ensure microbiology cure and to also help identify any kind of emerging resistance. So even though you may clear the infection a little bit sooner, uh, if it is resistant to uh, azithromycin, you're not going to clear it. And so it's important to 
try and encourage people actually um, if they you know don't do the test of cure uh, too early and if possible don't actually have sex until your test of cure results have come back which is probably the gold standard best option if possible but uh, a lot of people can't seem to be able to do that unfortunately how do you treat the contacts? Well, you only treat partners, and that includes their non-regular uh, partners if, uh, if there's likely to be so, um, further sexual contact. So you only treat current partners, basically. Uh, and this is to reduce the reinfection to the index patient. Uh, partners should be given the same antibiotic as an index patient because they're likely to have the same type of uh, resistance um, for that particular bacteria. Okay, and um, what um, and question I'm always asked is uh, by patients who have uh, been in a relationship for quite a long time and they've suddenly popped up with MGM positive. Is that a marker of infidelity? No, it's not. Okay, MGM is not a marker of infidelity. Okay, and it can't be used as such. The same as um, HSV, which is herpes, can't be used as a marker of infidelity either. Okay. Um, so uh, get that out of your brain. If you've got questions about infidelity, that is completely separate uh, to whether you uh, are positive for mycoplasma genitalia. You can carry this in a relationship for many, many years, uh, but for some reason it then becomes a problem and it's important uh, to realise that. So either that, um, great websites I've used to uh, put this episode together and uh, I've, uh, please note the first one which is um, uh, the BASH guidelines and the websites on BASH.org. Uh, a lot of this presentation is based on those particular type of um, guidelines themselves and I'd like to thank you all for watching and if you like this episode please like, subscribe and share and thank you very very much for your time. Take care and see you in the next episode. Goodbye.